lecture today. This is our fourth lecture in this series. So, so let me remind you first what you what we discussed uh, so far. So we we do a course practical cryptography. So then you should have idea about what is cryptography. So in the beginning of the lecture, I just did the introduction to cryptography with the classical cryptographic algorithm. In the cryptography algorithms, mainly I mentioned that in the last week, also can divide into two groups, symmetric encryption and the symmetric encryption. In the symmetric encryption algorithms, we divide into two groups, what we call it as classical cryptographic algorithms and the modern cryptographic algorithm. So in the first lecture, we discussed classical cryptographic algorithms. Among them, we discussed stream ciphers, log ciphers, uh, and sorry, substitution ciphers, permutation ciphers, like that. And then later on, we start discussion on modern cryptographic algorithm. In the modern cryptographic algorithm, we can see two types of modern cryptographic algorithms. They are called then symmetric key and cryptographic algorithm. Sorry, stream, stream ciphers and the block ciphers. So if I repeat, there are two types, symmetric and asymmetric. Under symmetric, we have modern and classical. Under modern, we have stream ciphers and block ciphers. So in the last lecture, we discussed three block cipher algorithms. What are they? AES, DES, and triple DES. Uh, so in addition to that, there are other stream cipher algorithms available. Uh, uh, stream cipher algorithms available for RC, for C, like that. We are not going to discuss in detail because most of the modern cryptographic algorithms are block ciphers, and the international standard for encryption is actually AES, Advanced Encryption Standard. So, if I remind you about these algorithms, which are block cipher algorithms, which we discussed in the last week. So the first one we discussed was DES, that is data encryption standard. Features of DES is actually DES is 56-bit key algorithm. It used 64-bit uh, blocks for encryption. 64 bits means eight bytes. And after encrypt, it produced 64-bit of cipher text. So 56-bit algorithms are not safe. 56-bit key is not safe today because two to the power 56 combination of the keys can be brute force. So because of that, we need to have some mechanism to improve the security of this algorithm. We discussed the method we use to do so, for which has triple DES. Triple DES algorithm will encrypt the data three rounds with three different keys. And there are variations of those triple days, which you call it as triple days with two keys. In this situation, we encrypt the data with two keys, like K1, K2, and K1, I explained in the last week. Then we discuss there is another standard, new standard for data protection, is called it as advanced encryption standard, or in short, it is called as AES. We discuss the detail how AES algorithm works. AES also block size. AES block size is, as you remember, 128 bits. That is 16 bytes, double than this. AES can use three different key sizes. We can use three different key sizes with AES. Those key sizes are 128 bit, 192 bit, and 256 bits. We discussed all internal rounds of key address encryption in the last week. So the idea of today is discuss how these block ciphers use in different operation and modes. Last week I slowly start discussing about block cipher operation and mode. This week I explain those block cipher operation and mode in detail with some examples. So you can perfectly understand after this week how those block ciphers work in different operational modes. So practically in our day-to-day -day application, we use one of these modes uh, to 
uh, operates, uh, or in other words, to encrypt and decrypt our data. Before we do any of, uh, uh, before we apply those operations, so our data need to be padded. So I discussed also in the last week the method of padding the information. So for example, if our block size is less than one byte, either we pad it with zero one. If we need two bytes, so we pad it with zero two. If we need three bytes to complete the block, we pad it with zero three. If we need eight bytes, if we have the data which match to the block size, then we add a new extra block with zero eight. So we discuss that, it's something like that. So if the, let's say this example of this, this block size is eight byte. So you see there is eight byte here. So there we only want to encrypt A, B, C, then three bytes of data. So we cannot encrypt with three bytes with this. So because block, because block size is eight, so we need to add five W data. So for that we add C, five zero bytes and then create the uh, encrypted data or the ciphertext. So in the other side, then the recipient will decrypt that data. When they see there are five times zero five, they identify that is dummy and remove it. Similarly, if we have like, let's say six data to be encrypted, two bytes is missing or two bytes is needed to complete the block. So we add two times number two. So then after decryption, if someone see it two times number two, they know it's, this is dummy and they remove that. Similarly, if one byte is missing, we add number one. So if our data is fit into the block, we add completely new block. Why do we need to do so? We need to do so, let's assume we have complete data and we don't have this uh, yellow color new block, let's assume that. If then what happens? If you have complete data, and assume our last two bytes are number two, for some reason. So if that happens, then our recipient might think, this two times number two here, this is kind of dummy, and they might remove that. So actually they are real. So in order to kind of uh, secure, the last bytes of this block, we must add the new block. In other words, if our data fit into the block size, we still need to pack. So that means we are adding completely new block. So for example, if our input plane text size is five, our output size, ciphertext size is eight. If our input plane text size is seven, like here, our output size is eight. If our input plane text size is eight, our output size text size becomes 16, double, because we add the new block. That is for this. So if A is, block size is 16. So then it's, if you have 16 bytes, so then it add the new block, then cyclotest become 32. So I will show you with some examples how those planning works in during the lecture today. Right. Our data after we pad, we do the encryption. In order to do the encryption, we are using different encryption modes. One of the simplest modes we use to, for the encryption is called electronic code book mode. I discussed it briefly in the last week as well. In the electronic code book mode, what we do, we divide our data into the different data, me, different data blocks. Different data blocks like that. Sorry. Uh, sorry, this slides. Uh, different data blocks like that. And then, uh, so we divide our data and our last block, 
may be padded, and each of these locks will encrypt with the block cipher, applying the same key, and produce the cipher text. So those locks are independent of each other. So that is how electronic code book mode works. In this mode, so weakness of this mode is basically some of the information in this plain text data may not destroy properly when use this mode, especially graphical information. So for example, this is how it looks like when you encrypt the image. Because, so if you encrypt a one block, then one block may contain the information about some pixel. And when you encrypt that block, it produces another block. Another block is another number. So that number is maybe a different color. So information about that pixel is still maybe invisible to the humans. So because of that, we are not recommended to use ECB mode to encrypt the real, uh, pictures, videos, like information. ECB is mainly used to encrypt some small set of data, maybe one, one block of the data, like maybe some of your credit card numbers or some other confidential information, just like one block, right? So, the recommended encryption mode most of the people use nowadays are called it as cipher block chaining mode. There is an alternative to this cipher block chaining mode called as GCM as well. I will discuss GCM to SDM. So, so CBC, cipher block chaining mode, are wide use. So, cipher block chaining modes. Take all the data, link each other in the, using some mechanism. So it use some other input parameter called initial vector in addition to the security key. It is suitable to do the bulk encryption as well as communication. So let's have a close look how cipher block chaining modes works. In the cipher block chaining modes, again, our plain text divide into different blocks. And the last block may be padded. Uh, actually, last block is padded. Then what we do, we take the first block and we take the initial vector and we do XO the first block with the initial vector. Size of our initial vector must be equal to the block size. So my slide, I take example of this. So the block size is 8 byte or 64 bits, in other words. If that block is AES, advanced encryption standard, the block size should be 16 bytes, 128 bits. No. So then I wish should be 128 bits in the AES. In case of test, initial vector is 64 bits. So in this mode, what we do, we take the initial vector which is 64 bit longer or size of 64 bits, XO that with our input data, and the result will encrypt with the test. It's kind of two layer of encryption. In the first layer, it do a Vernon cipher, that is initial vector XO with the block. And in the second layer, it do the block cipher encryption, that is this OAS. So in this example, it shows this. And it produced the first block of the cipher text. So then we take the next block, and we need to do the same process. So we take the next block and need to then add the initial vector. So what we do, we take the output of the last block as the initial vector to the next block. That means we take this hypertext here, which we produce on the first block, 
and XOR it with the second law, second pair X. And the results it feeded to the log cycle. Then it produced the ciphertext of the second law. Similarly, we check the output of the second block as the input to the third. So then we take the third block of the plain text, XO with the ciphertext of the second block, result will XO with the this and produce the third block of the ciphertext. Then it goes on. Then I mentioned that when you go like that in the last block, actually depend on entire plain text. So that means last block can be used to check the authentication of the message. That means actually check the integrity and alterations of those messages. So it called it as message authentication code. So you see, in case we take change one bit of the message here, so it changed here because of that it changed here, then it changed here and it changed here and finally it changed here. So in other words, any changes in the message change the last block. So that's why it's become a message for the education code. So any block cipher in the CBC mode can be use as message authentication code to check the integrity of those messages. Not only that, that's not only the encryption, it can be used for integrity because of that. So the CBC mode is widely used in communication as well as bulk encryption. So ECB and the CBC are the two popular block cipher operation modes. So in these modes, so you in the CBC mode, especially we need the additional parameter for initial vector or initial value uh, to do the encryption. So our key as well as initial vector should be shared with the recipient somehow. So the way we're going to share those keys and the initial vectors, we will discuss later on. In addition to these two main modes, there are three major other modes of operations on the block cycles. So the three other modes which we're going to discuss actually convert a block cipher into a stream cipher. That means we can encrypt the data like uh, we are doing it in a stream cipher but we use a block cipher to generate a stream of security keys. So our real encryption is actually a block cipher, a stream cipher. Let's have a look those modes in detail. First, we will have a look on the cipher feedback mode. Cipher feedback mode is one of the historical modes which we use uh, with the block cycles. Let's try to understand how this mode works with this diagram. So here we are using again the initial vector, initial value. And E is our block cipher encryption algorithm. That is this or A is. I is the initial vector or what we call it as initial value. Size of this initial vector, that is n, should be equal to the block size of the algorithm. So, for example, if E is this, n is 56 bits, 64 bits. If E is this, n is 64 bits, that means 8 bytes. If E is A, yes, our n is 128 bits, that is. 16 bytes. So in this particular modes, let's see how we do encryption. 
So there what we do, we take the initial vector first, and we encrypt that initial vector with this block cipher, applying its security key. So when you get the initial vector to encryption algorithm, and you feed it, it will produce the ciphertext of initial vector. So this is the ciphertext of initial vector. So then what we do, we take the uh, X, R bits, we take R bits, R bits from our ciphertext, and we pick leftmost R bit with this encrypted initial vector, and we XOR these two together to produce the ciphertext. So as you may understood, our real encryption is this, the binary word of cipher or the X operation. So this binary word of cipher, we need to create a random key. We use a block cipher to create that random key. How do you create that random key? We take another random number called initial vector. We encrypt that initial vector with the block cipher by applying our security key and it produces the ciphertext or what we call it as random number. So from that random number, we pick R bits in case to end, if you want to encrypt R bits, we take a leftmost R bits, XO with the leftmost, uh, XO with the plain text of R bits and transmit. So for example, if you want to encrypt byte at a time, our R is eight. If we want to encrypt bit at a time, our R is one. So whatever lesson of algorithm, we select the number R. So usually it we do byte at a time. So then now R is eight bits. So we pick, uh, pick leftmost R bits, so with the plain text, create the ciphertext and transmit that to the other party to our recipient. So our recipient should be get ready for the decryption. Obviously, recipient must have the same key and the initial vector. How both parties share these initial vectors and the security key, we will discuss in some other lecture. At the moment, we assume somehow our recipients or the party who is going to decide must or to going to decrypt have the initial vector and the key. So then what the recipient should do, they get the initial vector and encrypt that initial vector by applying the security key and they get the ciphertext of initial vector and they wait for the ciphertext to be coming. When the R bits of ciphertext receives, so they pick the R bits of initial vector generator and then they XO these two together. That will create a plain text back. This is encryption, create the ciphertext. So put the ciphertext with the same key will produce the plain text. How do they generate the same key? Take the same initial vector Encrypt that initial vector using the same security key, get the same ciphertext. So then leftmost R bit of here equal to the leftmost R bit here. Right. So then first byte or first R bit encrypt, decrypt. So now we need to be ready to decrypt the next R bits. For that, we need to create the next key. So there, how do we do? We take the ciphertext we receive and we feed back here to the initial vector. That means we shift the R bits to the left side and feed the R bits of ciphertext to the right side here. So it creates a new initial vector. So we encrypt that new initial vector and it creates the new block of ciphertext. So that is a new key for the decryption, the next block. So we then decrypt. 
And then whatever we receive on the second time, we feed it back to the third and create the ciphertext and use that to decrypt the third byte. Like that, we do encryption and decryption. As you may understood, this mode may have a major issue. The major issue it has is error propagation. So for example, if someone at transmission alter a ciphertext here, so that altered ciphertext will feed it back to the initial vector. And since it gets altered, we may not end up with the same key, like for this part. So that means after this alteration, we may not be able to decrypt any of the data we receive because this altered cipher has screwed up the initial vector. So that continuously loop here, so we should not be able to decrypt the information after this attack here at the wind. So this type of feedback mode, we say lab has error propagation. So in order to solve this error propagation problem, we use a different mode. So that particular mode, we call it as output feedback mode. O OCB mode, o sorry, OFB, OFB mode. Output feedback mode. In the output feedback mode, what we do, same thing as the cipher block chaining mode, only difference is where are we going to feed back the feed, where are we going to feed back into the initial vector. In the cipher feedback mode, we are feeding the cipher text. Output feedback mode, we feed the output of the encryption of the block cipher to the top. Let me explain how this output feedback mode works. In this output feedback mode, we have an initial vector here again. So we feed that initial vector to the block cipher and encrypt that initial vector. Same as this CBC, same as this cipher feedback mode. Then we pick the leftmost orbit here and XO that with the plain text to produce the first character or first rounds of ciphertext. So in order to create the next round of ciphertext, we need to get the different key here. There, what we do, we take the end bits of this output of the first round and feed it back to the top to generate the next key. So in the recipient side, also the same. In the recipient side, we must have the initial vector. So we encrypt that initial vector with the security key shard, and then it produces the ciphertext here. So from those ciphertext, we pick the leftmost orbit, XO with this ciphertext we receive, and then it gets the plain text. So that in order to decrypt the next block of the plain text, we need to get the next key here. So how do we get the next key? We feed back this output of that to the top and then encrypt it again. So there we get the new number, that is new key. So leftmost orbits will be selected from that key to decrypt the next arrival input data. So that's how output feedback mode. So cipher feedback mode and output feedback mode works similarly. The difference between these two is how do we feed him back. So for example, if I show again the previous slide here, it feedbacking from the cipher to the top. So in the output feedback mode, we are not feedbacking the cipher, instead of we are feedbacking, feedbacking the output here to the 
output here to the top. So it's called as output feedback modes. In other words, what we do, we independently generate sequence of the keys, and those sequence of the keys will be used to input the, our plain text. So that's how output feedback mode works. So the cyber feedback mode and the output feedback modes operate sequentially. That means in order to operate X block, we need to finish X minus one block first. So then we can finish the X, X round. So then we need the output of the X to finish the X plus one round. So it's operate sequentially. Cypher block training mode and output feedback mode operates sequentially on the information and more the data. But practically, when you do data communication, so that is not depend on each other. That means, so for example, if you send a data packet to some, some, some destination, so we always may not receive the data packets on the same order into the network plane. We may receive the data packets in different modes. So if you use this OFB or CFE modes, so we have to arrange our data into the sequential order and should apply the encryption to each and every data independently. Now, so thing is, so if you use kind of like uh, cipher, cipher feedback mode, what's happened? Without the feedback modes, what's happened? So we need to add, in, input the data sequential. So but in practically we are not receiving the data sequential. So for example, I transmit the data from the node A, node B not receive it sequentially one after other. Maybe the packet one may receive after the packet 10. So because in the network, we are using different paths to transmit the data. So if you use any sequential operational modes, issue with that, we need to wait until we receive all the data, which we transmit. Or in other words, in OFP or CFP modes, we could do parallel processing. We are do sequential processing. So practically, we need some modes which can handle the parallel processing in a parallel encryption and decryption. The modes which we develop for that, it called as counter mode or the CTR mode. In the CTR modes, what happened? We have a sequence of counters. How do you create these counters? We will discuss later on. Counter is some number you know. Maybe start from zero, so start from some other number and increase one by one. So, so then what happened in this counter mode? So we take those counters one by one and encrypt those counters with the block ciphers. Ciphertext of this encrypted counter is used as the security key for encryption of the plain text. So then what's happened? We take those counter encrypt that we get the ciphertext of this counter, and then we take the, our plain text and XO that with this output, and it produces the ciphertext. In the next byte, so we take the next counter and encrypt with the block cipher and then XO the, that output with the data of the second, second, second plain text block. So it produces the second ciphertext block. And it goes on. As you may understood in this counter mode, you may see we operate parallel, independent. So we each and every round not depend on each other. So initially we have to use a sequence of counter generate 
After that, each counter can use to generate keys and do the decryption independent from the previous node. So there we don't want to wait till previous nodes finish the decryption or the encryption in order to process the present node, present, present uh, data. How do you generate those counters? So basically a simple method we use to generate counters is like this. So what we do, our initial vector we divide into two parts. The first part we store a nonce or some random circle. And after that, second part will set it as zero. So then it increased by one and two and so on. So part of this initial vector is a nonce, a random value. The other part is a simple counter. So after we fill out those counters, those counters will encrypt using the, the non-block ciphers. The result is somewhat a security key which can use to decrypt the plain text. So then what we do, we take this uh, plain text, XOR it, produce the ciphertext. Let's say next time this plain text arrives before this, this sorry, this ciphertext arrives before this. So we can use this ciphertext we re received with this counter to be with that. So CTR is kind of the mode where we use in our access points. However, when you use that to, in this networking level, encryption and decryption, such as this Wi-Fi encryption, we do few alterations. So those alterations I will discuss in a minute. So advantage and the limitations of the CTR, mainly CTR modes error may not propagate. It is very good when you in the situation where we can implement those encryption and decryption parallel. So we do, we can process independently parallel way. We can process the encryption and decryption in counter mode. We can't do that in the CBC mode because it always needs the previous block. I said that in present practices, counter mode is improved into a different mode called DCM mode, Gallus counter. Gallus counters are different style of counter mode where we heavily use, especially in the present security protocols such as IPC. Let's carefully have a look how this Gallus mode of operation works. Advantage of this particular mode is we can use that mode to check the integrity of the data messages. Uh, in, in, in pure counter mode, integrity cannot change, check. But if you use GCM mode, integrity can check how it works. So in this mode, first of all, we need to, have to get the initial vector. So this initial vector added to the counter, like previously explained, and then we increase this counter one by one and create the rest of the counters we require. Then what we do, we encrypt this counter we created with the 
algorithm counter encrypt with the algorithm for ex and produce the ciphertext so then we we increase the counter and get a new counter that counter will encrypt it and this result exhaust with the plain text. So we use the value of the first counter as the random key for encryption of the plain text. So in the next encryption, we use the second counter and encrypt the second counter with the same block cipher and same key, it produces the some output. So this output we XO with the plain text and so on. So that creates the encryption. So the advantage of this GCF mode is the same mode can be used to create the message or the indication code. How do you improve this BCM mode to create the message of indication code? For that, we use a small trick. So, there are what we do when you create the second count encryption or the first ciphertext block. We XO this first ciphertext block with some information. So, the information we use here, call it as additional data. So additional data requires, in case we want to uh, use some data in our packet where we don't want to do encryption. The best example is in the IPsec-like protocols, we will encrypt the body of this packet, but we cannot encrypt the header of the packet. Because if we change the header of the packet, then that packet cannot run. So we need to keep that kind of information without encrypting. So, but still we want to use that information to calculate the message of indication code. Otherwise, what happens? Someone change this IP address and this misroute the this route the packet to some other destination. So, in other words, we want to still keep some data to include it in the authentication calculation in this counter mode. So the data, here it's called it as additional data, it's some, some data like that. So we have this additional data applied to the function called galaxy, galaxy function. And the result of that, XO with the ciphertext of first round of encryption, and so on. So that means, so we take the output of this operation to the galaxy mode and feed that to the second out of ciphertext, XO, and create the galaxy output again. And we can XO that with some other information such as information unique to this particular user and the result is again you finish in the gallons mode and then we exo that with the output of the first block encryption not only that we use the information like the length of the input data in order to do these calculations. So that means in this GCM mode, we can do encryption, decryption, as well as we can use it to calculate the message authentication code. So mainly when you connect your device to the access point in the network, 
when you connect the device into the access points of the network, we use the GCM mode. The encryption algorithm we use here is AES. So that code it has AES GCM. AES in GCM mode used to do the authentication of the packet, that means to check the integrity of the data as well with the encryption. So that is the main mode, as I mentioned, which uses the low level networking security protocols, such as IPsec, TLS, WPA2, and so on. So those protocols, I might discuss, I might discuss those protocols uh, at the end of this lecture series. So various functions is something like that. So we use those functions to do this calculation, like SSG function. We can use this to calculate uh, the value of Galias functions, equation to calculate that value of the Galias function. So basically, it's kind of a hash function. So we learned so far six modes of operation. So we call them as electronic code book mode, cipher blockchain in mode, cipher feedback mode, output feedback mode, counter mode. So those are the five major operational modes. Among those operational modes, ECB and CBC modes works as a block cipher. OFB, CMB, CTR modes convert that block cipher into the stream cipher. So then the CTR modes will be converted to a mode called AES GCM modes. In this GCM modes, we can use to calculate the authentication code or what we call message authentication codes. So we call it as authentication tag as well. So in order to do authentication tag calculation, I said we can input the non-encrypted data as well. So for example, this slide shows there is a data package. There are headers, sequence, and data. where we want to encrypt uh, sequence uh, uh, and then kind of uh, data, but we want to keep the, sorry, we want to keep the sequence and header plane and want to encrypt only the data, but we still want to keep the header and the sequence, we want, we still want to input the header and the sequence when you calculate the authentication code. So then in this example, header and sequence consider has authenticated data. So in the GCM mode, that the data which we want to encrypt as this authentication data and create the encrypted data as well as what we call it as authentication tag. So using that tag, we can check the integrity of this communication. Plus since we do encryption, we could achieve the confidentiality as well. So that's how AES GCM works. Most of these encryption uh, protocols, present encryption protocols, use AES GCM nodes. So it is now getting popular. And before that, we are heavily used CBC mode. Right. So now what I can do, so in addition to, okay, in addition to the block ciphers we discussed like AES and uh, this, there are several other block ciphers available. One of these block ciphers are called IDEA, other one is called blow sheet, and then there is one, uh, one called uh, RC5, 
and there is the one called cast like that there are several other industrial block ciphers available symmetric key block ciphers available we only discuss two symmetric key block ciphers they are this and AES. and also we discuss how we operate these block ciphers in different block cipher operational modes all right so now what i do i will show you how do you use java uh, to create a simple application for encrypting and decrypting in those different modes which we discuss so by doing that we may understand how these modes works let me start with ECB and show you how those modes work uh, with the simple application. So for that I am using Java. Okay. Uh, let me now share my uh, terminal. Uh, let me now uh, show you some examples with Java. Uh, where we do encryption and decryption. Okay, so there are some uh, codes here, you see. So I, I will show you those codes one by one. Uh, so let me speak my window uh, so to and go to the uh, same directory uh, right we have the ter two terminals on the same directory uh, Right, uh, so okay. So you see my terminal now, no? Right. Okay, so then I open some simple encryption program. Uh, so, uh, which do the encryption and decryption in the ECB mode. Right. So you see this simple JAR program where we do the encryption and decryption of the data in the ECB mode. So first of all, when you want to do the uh, encryption, decryption in the Java, we need to import these two libraries. Sorry. Uh, import these two libraries, what do you call it as? Uh, Java security library and Java crypto library, right? So, what I am going to encrypt is the message called hello, right? So, you know, you see it's, there are five characters in this message. So, all this encryption, decryption, we are feeding the bytes. So, we cannot encrypt strings. So, because of that, we take the bytes out of this message. This is my input data, right? It's in the byte form, right? So then for the encryption, we need to generate security key. So for that, the Java has a class called key generator class. As I mentioned in one of my previous lecture, all the cryptographic classes are static classes in Java. So we can call the method in this class without getting the instance. So we use the class name key generator and call the get instance method with the algorithm name. So in other words, this, this line tells, give me the AES implementation from the Java library. Uh, and it assigned to the object called generator. So we get the key generator object there. So after that, we have to initialize this key generator object. 
So then, in, when we initialize it, we need to give the size of the key we're going to use. So the recommended key size is 256 bit. So after that, we call the method called generate key. Generate key method will generate the key. So it creates the AES key. Right. So then, we, in order to do the encryption, we need to get the object called cipher. So when you create the cipher object, we need to tell the algorithm we're going to use, mode we're going to use, and the padding scheme we're going to use. So here we say we would like to use AES algorithm with ECB mode, PKCS file padding scheme. So I have explained all of those to you right now. Right. So when I pass that string to the get instance method, it returns me the cipher object which operates in AES algorithm in the CBC mode with PKCS file padding. After that, I have to initialize this cipher. So this is symmetric key encryption. Symmetric key encryption can be used for encryption as well as decryption. So because of that, in the initialization, I have to tell what I'm going to do. So here I tell, I want to use it for encryption. So I say cipher encrypt. And then I pass the key generated here for the encryption. So now my cipher is ready for the encryption. So then my encryption, I use the method called do final. So then what I do, the, my data here, input data, I feed it to the do final method. So this do final method encrypt that data and returns me the cipher text, right? If that data need to be padded, do final method will automatically do the padding and create the file ciphertext block and return the entire ciphertext to this object or this byte array. So in these two lines, next two lines here, I print the length of this ciphertext and the ciphertext in hexadecimal format on the terminal to see that whether it get encrypted. After that, I do the decryption of the same program to the simplicity. So there what I do then, I initialize the same cipher in the decryption mode. For that, I apply the same key. So in practically, my decryption application is a separate application. So then for that application, I have to pass that key and key to the other side for that application. How do you pass the key between these two applications? And those things we will discuss later on. By simplicity, I am doing encryption and decryption in the same program. So I have access to the same key here. So I pass the same key here into the decryption and pre initialize the cipher in the decryption mode. So then I call the do final method with the ciphertext. So this ciphertext here passes to this do final method, it do the decryption and returns me the plain text. So in the next two lines, I print the plain text length and the plain text here to check whether I get that data correctly decrypted. So you see, this is a very simple program where I use ECB mode, electronic code book mode to encrypt this hello uh, encrypt the word called hello. Right. Let me run that program and show you the output. So first of all, I compile this program. Right. Then I run that program. You see, by plain text 16, this is encrypted data. This is my hello, plain text, and the length is five. 
since I am using AES, my output size is 16 because AES use 16 by blocks, 128 bit blocks. So my 128 bit block. So using my five byte plain text, it pattern and create the 16 byte block and encrypt that block using this AES algorithm. That's why it becomes 16. Let's say I change my algorithm. So for instance, let's say I want to use this. Then instead of AES, I have to type this here. And then I need to change key size to be 56 bits. And then the SIP algorithm here should be this in ECB PKCS5 padding. Right? So now let me run this program. I save this program, then compile it, and run it. You see now, my block size, ciphertext block size become eight bytes because this block size is 64 bits. Still I use the same plain text size, right? Let me now show you by increase the plain text size. Maybe what I do here, instead of hello, I am encrypting hello one, two, three. So now my block size, input plain text size is eight bytes, right? I'm still using this, but my input size is eight bytes. If the input size is eight bytes, so then, so you remember in the PKCS5 padding, we are adding a new complete dummy block. So I will show you, I'll compile this program back here and run that. So you see here, then what's happened here? When I run it, my ciphertext becomes 16 because it's added a new block. So you, you remember PKCS5 padding. So previously it's eight byte, so my plain text size is five. Now my plain text size is eight, so ciphertext size becomes 16, like that. So that's how ECB works. So for example, I will show you maybe, maybe I will uh, further increase my plain text size here. Now my plain text size is uh, 60. So I am using the uh, desk algorithm. So can you guess the ciphertext size? So you see here, my ciphertext size is 24 bytes. Why? Two, eight bytes and one dummy block, eight bytes, all together see 24 bytes. So I use this algorithm. Okay, without changing the plain text, my input data, let me change the algorithm to AES back. <coughs> Sorry. Algorithm to AES back. Right. AES algorithm. I use key size as 128B. Then here is right now. Can you guess the block size? A is use 16 by blocks, so my input size is 16, so it fit to the AES block size. So then it should add a new block according to this PKCS5 padding. Then that means my ciphertext size should become 32. So you see like that. My ciphertext size become uh, 32. 
right? My input size is 16. So that's how PKCS 5 padding works in the ECB mode. Okay, now I will show you the implementation of uh, CBC mode, Cyber Blockchaining mode. Right? And when you want to implement Cyber Blockchaining mode, you need to import additional class called cryptographic specification class. So in addition to these two classes, right? So let's see how this mode works. So in this mode, CBC mode, assume this is cycle of chaining mode. Assume I am using this input again, like hello for encryption. So this is my uh, data to be encrypted. And I use the AES algorithm. My key size here is 128 bit. I generate AES key. So this cyber blockchaining mode need uh, any uh, next input or additional input called initial vector. We discuss that. In addition to the key, we need to get the initial vector. So since I'm using AES, so size of the initial vector should be size of the block. So that is 16 bytes. I create a byte array to store the initial vector. So you, then I get an object of the random number generator. And using that, I call the method in the random number generator called x by passing that initial vector here. So with that, what happens? So this random number generator will generate a random initial vector and give that value, store that value in the byte array. I mean. So then I create an object called IV parameter specification to store this initial vector. I put this IV and create an object called IV parameter specification. So that is the initial vector which I'm going to use in the CPC mode. So after I do that, what I do, I get the instance of the cipher. Now I'm getting AES cipher in the cipher blockchaining CBC mode. Right? CBC mode. And the padding scheme, which I'm going to use here, is, uh, let's say, uh, PKCS. Phi padding. Then I initialize the cipher in the encryption mode with the key and the initial vector. In the ECB, it's only the key. So in the CBC, we have another input that is initial vector. So I put that. I initialize the cipher. So after that, you see I call the do final method with input data then it creates the ciphertext. So I printed those ciphertexts using these two lines. And after that, I do the decryption. So in the decryption also, I create the, I initialize this cipher object, the decryption mode and the key and the same initial vector. So then I pass the ciphertext, it's written back the plain text. So that's how we could use CBC mode. Let me now uh, compile this program and run it. So you see, so I get I ended up with the 16 bytes of ciphertext. My plain text size is five. Right? I ended up with 16 bytes of ciphertext. So it's a block cipher. 
It's a block size or more. Right. So, so I use PKCS5 padding. So instead of PKCS5 padding, if I want, I can tell it here, don't use padding. That is what we call no padding. If you say no padding, then let's say what's happening. So I say, now I am going to use CBC mode without padding and then more to do the encryption. Can I do that? So let's try. I clear my terminal a bit. I compile the program and then run it. So you see, I get an exception. Secure exception. Say it cannot. Because block cipher need the input match to the block. If it is less than that, we cannot do the encryption. If we want to do the encryption, so then we need to pack and make that block equal to this, make my input data equal to the block size. If you say no padding, that means I say don't pad, then I have only, they say my input is only five bytes cannot use for encryption. So if you want to encrypt these five bytes, I must pack. So then I must use PKCS5 padding here. Unless otherwise, I have to use 16 bytes here. So if you have 16 bytes here like that, it will work. Then we have 16 bytes here, right? Then my data is equal to the block size. Then we don't need padding. In case, if you want to use like that, that is possible. So, you see it works. We can use a block cipher even without padding for the encryption. In that case, our data must be equal to the block size. Practically, that is not so. Our data usually is not equal to block size. Then that means we have to use padding. Right, so it's always when you use CBC or ECB mode, you must use padding like that here. The padding scheme, recommended padding scheme is PKCS5 padding, right here. So if you use padding, so then my data is equal to the block size here, we add the extra block. So you remember how that PKCS5 padding works, you see now. I compile this program now and run that. Now it works. In previously, if no padding, it's same as the ciphertext length, the same as the plain text length, you see 16, 16. If I use padding, since it's at the new block, my ciphertext size become 32. Plain text size 16, ciphertext size become 32 because it's at the new block in case of padding. Right? So I, I hope with this example you understand how this padding works, how the CBC mode works, and how ECB mode works. Now let's move on to a counter mode or uh, any other, uh, other mode, uh, like counter mode. So let's see. CTR mode. CTR mode, sorry. Counter modes basically convert a block cipher into a stream cipher. I will show you then. So you see my input size here get hello, five bytes. And I'm going to use this cipher here in this counter mode. So my key size is 56 bit. Counter mode need to have initial counter again that is similar to initial value. So I create an 8 byte of initial vector to store my initial counter, 64 bits initial counter because block size of DES is 64 bit. So I'm using DES here. So I generate initial counter randomly. 
So after that, this counter value automatically equates one by one, right? So then I get the instance of this cipher now. So now you see I'm getting this cipher in CTR mode, no padding, because we don't need to pad. We don't need to pad uh, in this counter mode. It's converter block to the string, right? So then what's happened? I initialize the cipher again in, in, in the encryption mode with the key and this IV initial counter. And I call do final by feeding my data here, five bytes of data. So it create the cipher text. Here, then I do the decryption. In the decryption, I again initialize that to the decryption mode with the key and the IV. And I put the cipher text, it returns back the plain text. Let me compile this program now. Uh, that is uh, CTR, CTR of Java, and run it. So you see, my ciphertext size is five byte. And my plain text size is five byte because that is encrypt byte at a time, perhaps. It's a stream site. It is a stream site. Right? So previously, if it is a CBC mode, so we, we, we will get an exception here because the input data is not matched to the out block size. So we cannot use no padding here. So I will show you that if you're interested. So even in the, let's check this CTR mode. Let's change the CTR mode to the CBC and try to run that. It may not work because in the CBC we expect input data to equal to the padding uh, block size. We cannot use no padding here. We must use PKCS5 padding here. So let's see, let's run that and see whether it works. I compile that, run it. You see, I got the error. Because if you use CBC mode, we must use padding. If you use counter mode, we don't need to do padding. It converts a stream cipher, block cipher into the stream cipher so we don't need to do padding here. So if you have five bytes to encrypt, it produces five bytes of the cipher text. So here we use no padding because of that. So now you see, let me change the algorithm as well if you're interested. So for example, instead of this, I can use AES, then this key size need to be like 256. And then my initial vector size need to be double because in the AES block size is 16, then initial counter should be 16 bytes. Uh, then the algorithm here, not this, it should be AES. So then it should work. Let's see. I combine and run. So you see it's work. Right, so my plain text is five by hello. My cipher text is also five by right. It won't do any padding, just encrypt using the counter mode. Right now, I show you some example of DCF modes. DCF mode. Right. In this GCM mode, I am going to encrypt some data called hello, and also I use some authenticated data. That means some data which I'm not going to encrypt, but I am use that data for authentication purpose, like the header of the packet. So you see, this is kind of like IP address of this message. Right, so then this message is not going to encrypt, but we, this message will include when we calculate the authentication tag. That means actually message authentication port. DCM modes is a all 
extended to the counter mode as I explained, which going to use or check the integrity as well as confidentiality. For that, you see I'm using AES algorithm and I generate the initial counter. So there, if you use GCM mode, I have to get uh, what we call it as GCM parameter specification. In the GCM parameter specification, there are two inputs. First one is the length of the authentication code. Second one is the initial vector. So length of the authentication code is equal to this block size, that is 128 bit blocks in the AES. So you see I'm getting the algorithm AES in GCM with no padding because it's also a stream cipher kind of, so we don't need the padding. So I initialize in the encryption mode with the T and the IV. After that, so I need to add the authentication data. That's a plain text where we want to include it in the authentication calculation. So this is my AA data, that is header. Then I add the input date. So it creates then authentication pack plus ciphertext together. So I print this on the terminal. And then this is my decryption. So in the decryption, I initialize it, I add the authenticated data, and I put the cybernetics back, it returns me the plain text. Uh, let me run that program and show you how it works. Uh, here. So I run the GCMO, compile it, and run like that you see so you see i am entering five bytes of plain text into the gcm mode ended up with 21 bytes of hypertext how that could be happen so actually these 21 bytes include first 16 bytes is the authentication tag that means basically authentication code so first a 16 byte is the authentication tag because I say here tag size is 128 bits that is authentication tag and then add the five bytes to the end so it becomes 16 521 so for example let me increase now the plain text size to be eight but authentication tag is fixed length. So it's a message authentication code is fixed length. It's a 128 bit code here in this example. So when I compile this program and run that, and run it, You see, it becomes 24 because 16 byte of authentication and an 8 byte of cipher text. So, 24 bytes together. So that's how the GCM modes works. GCM modes include the authentication tag and cipher text together. So that's the most popular modes that's used in the WPA2 protocol while it communicate with the access points. Right, WTA2 WPA2 protocol use AES and GCM modes when they send data packets from your device to the access point. So that's how it's get encrypted and different. So you see, uh, I discuss different uh, modes of operation, and I show you how do you. Implement those modus operation using uh, my Java examples. As usual, I upload those, uh, I push those programs into the GitHub, uh, course GitHub, so you can access those. 
Using those examples, I will ask you to write some program during the weekend. So you can write the program as the third assignment and then email it to the BD Red people uh, before the deadline. So I will kind of like give you this example quotes and then those quotes uh, you can use it and then you can use those quotes to uh, implement what I ask. So I will share that activity with you during the weekend. Okay, these are the examples. Now let me go back to my slide set and finish the lecture. Uh, I didn't finish uh, yet. Uh, let me finish the lecture. So I mentioned in addition to this uh, three block cipher, AES, triple days, and uh, DES, we have another block ciphers, uh, commercial block ciphers available. So, and also we have stream ciphers available. So one of the most famous stream ciphers, uh, we call it as uh, binary echo operation, or the binary burn-up cipher. So we studied how we can use block ciphers and convert them to a stream ciphers, kind of binary word of ciphers. So there are block ciphers used to create the stream of keys. So we discussed that. And in addition to those stream ciphers, X operation, there is a stream cipher called RC4. So those RC4 stream cipher is expired because it uses a very short key size, it's a 40-bit keys. So these 40-bit keys could be brute force very easily. So this RC4 was used by the previous wireless security protocol such as web, web protocol. So now we are not recommending this protocol at all. So recommended wireless security standard WPA2 protocol. It used AES in DCM mode. So RC4 is kind of obsolete cycle. So I put it there in order to be complete. In order to be complete this lecture, I put the names there so you understand that. Then I want to uh, tell you a little bit about the uh, political side behind it, like cryptography. So for example, like somewhere in the 90s, US government proposed a cryptographic algorithm for Clipper algorithm. So there they proposed to have a scheme called key score scan. In the key score standard, what they propose is, uh, their proposal is to divide the security keys when the software generates security keys. They propose to divide into two halves and to this, this and then to submit uh, one half to the governments and other half to the escrow agencies, independent agencies. So where then if some governments want to kind of elicit the communication, then they can get some kind of court order and go to the escrow agency and get the half they have. And then the since government has one half, they put they can put those two halves together and listen to a communication. So that is called as key score standard and the key score protocols. Uh, so basically uh, so those are these standards never get implemented because in the people with the software and the public, general public opposed to those standards and they don't like the government listen, our, we don't like anybody listen our communication. That's why it's our privacy. 
and basically even though some government propose such key score standards where the keys get deposited to escrow agencies may not going to work and it didn't work as well in the future so then i explain to you those kind of uh, uh, algorithms i i actually show you the code so you can go through those slides in the last slide of this lecture which i want to again highlight the problems of symmetric key encryption in general all the stream and the block ciphers so the main issue is the key distribution because we cannot distribute the symmetric keys through the same channel. And it also has a scalability problem. That means uh, we need a large number of keys. So in my next lecture, we discuss uh, symmetric key cryptography. So there we discuss how we could overcome these problems in the symmetric key system. Okay, with that, we can conclude the lecture today.